Welcome to Real World SQL Server Profiler. In this course, you'll learn how to correctly configure and use one of the most underutilized tools in the SQL Server library. SQL Server Profiler is an interface used to create and manage traces and analyze and replay trace results. Events are saved to a trace file that can later be analyzed or used to replay specific series of steps when trying to diagnose a problem. At its very base, SQL Server Profile is quite simply a way to capture what queries are being executed on your SQL servers. In this course, we'll talk about the architecture and often confusing nomenclature surrounding Profiler. Is an event the same thing as an event class? Why do some events capture nothing? In the SQL Server world, we don't say SQL Server Profile. We simply say Profiler or we're going to capture a trace. As a DBA or developer, Profiler is one of the single best tools in our arsenal for troubleshooting SQL Server issues. Thanks for your interest in Real World SQL Server Profiler, and we'll see you in the course. In this lesson, let's learn about the architecture of the SQL Server Profiler. Now, Profiler itself is really just a GUI. It's the underlying SQL trace that's actually doing most of the work when it comes to capturing SQL events and storing them for later use. SQL trace is a feature of SQL Server that can be accessed indirectly with the Profiler GUI, System Store Procedures, or programmatically using SMO or Server Management Objects. SQL trace is a very simple tool. Its job is just to capture SQL Server communications between the client and SQL Server. It acts similarly to a spectralized network stiffer that captures traffic on the network related to SQL Server and allows you to see exactly which events are being sent from the client to the server. Now, unlike a sniffer, which allows you to see every byte that is going over the network, SQL Trace only captures the processes specific to SQL Server. First, a SQL Server related event is created between the client and the SQL Server process in SQL Server. Events include many different types of activity that we're going to describe in detail later. As these events are occurring in SQL Server, it's the job of SQL Server Trace to capture the specific SQL Server events that are of interest and filter out those that aren't. Once these events are captured, they are queued up in memory. At this point, they could be sent directly to a database table, a physical file, or an SMO-based application. In addition to a SQL Server Profiler, SQL Server includes many system store procedures that use SMO to interact with SQL Server Trace. So in essence, SQL Trace is really a black box that we can't access directly. What we can do is simply interact with the tool. All right, in this lecture, let's go ahead and begin discussing Profiler. So here we have SQL Server Management Studio open, or SSMS for short. We come up here to our tools, and we go SQL Profiler. So let's open it up. Here it's saying, well, what server do you want to connect to? I've got to give it the essay here. Let's do that. Let's remember that. Let's say OK. And here, this first page, the general tab, is about as straightforward as you can get. The name of the trace, the provider, is the server. The type is obviously the version. Templates, we'll talk about templates a little later. We can use templates. Save to file means you're going to save it to a file. Save to a table means you're going to save it to a table. A little caveat here is that even if you save it to a file, later you can export it to a table. So most of the time, you will come over here and save this trace to a file. And the last one, Again, straightforward, enable trace stop time. Now, it's the second, it's the second tab here that requires a little more explanation. And I think that's just because of the nomenclature. So let's dive into it. Let's talk about the big four first. So we've got four key terms, events, data columns, filters, and trace that we really need to understand pretty comprehensively before we move on. So, an event. What's an event? Essentially, it's the occurrence of some defined action inside SQL Server. So, the execution of a store procedure is one example of an event. 
profile allows you to capture about 170 different SQL Server related events. An event category is a group of related events. For example, the stored procedure event category groups together all the events relating to the execution of a stored procedure. The event category will include events that, for example, allow you to capture information about when the procedure started, when it stopped, and so on. The next term is the event class. This refers to an event and all of the data columns associated with it. The next is data columns. Every event that can be captured includes a group of related data that describes the events and is stored in what are called data columns. Think of an event as a row in a database and data columns as the columns in a worksheet. Different events are associated with different data columns and not every data column is available for every event. Some of the data columns for the stored procedure event include event class, text data, application, reads, duration, Next is the concept of a filter. Many times we're not going to want to capture all the information, but only the information about a certain event. When this happens, we want to use a filter. For example, you only want to capture events from a selected user, a specific application, or maybe a given database. Filters allow you to tell Profiler that you only want to collect the rows with the specified filter. Lastly is this concept of a trace. A trace includes the events and data columns you collect and is usually stored in a physical file for later examination. A trace can be saved in many ways. Again, like I said earlier, it's usually saved in a file and analyzed between people or it can be exported to a table. All right, in this lecture, let's learn how to grant someone else other than SA the ability to run a trace. Now, here I'm connected as SA to this SQL01 instance, and obviously I can come up to Tools, Profiler, and create a trace. However, most users cannot. So let's go ahead and grant a user. All right, you can see here is the code for that. It's quite simple. Let's go create a user. I click New Login. We'll call this guy Sam. Sam will have the password of, uh-huh, uh uh-huh. We don't need any of this. Nope, we'll go to that. We will map him over here, user mappings, to this AdventureWorks database, data reader, data writer. We will say, okay. Now we're going to log, we're gonna disconnect from this session. And we're gonna connect as Sam. We are connected as Sam. Let's go here and try to run a trace. So it gives us this error message. In order to run a trace, you've got to be a member of the system administrator group or have the alter trace permission. So, okay, let's go ahead and fix that. Let's connect as me, as SA. Actually, we can do it right here. Let's just right click here and we can go to connection and we can go to change connection and we can go to SA and let's say the SA password is this and now we are going to give Sam the right to run a trace that did it now here is Sam let's disconnect let's reconnect Sam Sam Connect. Now, Sam should be able to come up here and say tools, new trace. Sam should be able to type his password in. And create a new trace. And it really is that simple to give someone the rights to create a trace. Now, obviously, you don't want to do this across the organization. You really only want key members of the organization who are really familiar with SQL Server to be creating traces against live production databases. All right, in this lecture, let's go ahead and look at the trace toolbar. Now, there's not a lot there, but what's there is very helpful to us. So let's go to Tools, Profiler. And here, let's go ahead and connect to 
Not sure why it doesn't save that, but I click this every single time. So here is our trace. Obviously, if we look at the toolbar, certain things populate or certain things are turned on. Certain parts of the trace are identified. Let's cancel out this and we can see certain things are turned off. So let's go ahead on the very left hand side. It's nice that I like this little IntelliSense new trace. All right. Let's go here. And we have our new trace properties. Over here we have templates. So let's cancel out of this again. Let's come back and cancel. Let's go over to templates. Again, we'll talk about templates in a minute. Here we can select the server type and it will give us a whole bunch of templates. Uh, basically, these are canned templates that we can use and the events behind them. All right, cancel. Uh, let's go to open a trace. So here we can go get a trace file. If we have one saved, we can save trace files and open them up when we want to. Let's cancel out of that and let's come over here, new trace. Let's connect. Now we have our trace properties here of our new trace. And let's go ahead and run it. And as we click run, we start our trace. Now we have some other icons. Here we get to search. All right. It's a you can search live, but it goes by so quickly that you won't get a lot out of it on most old TV boxes. Here we can clear the results of our window. Here we can pause the trace. Right? It tells us the trace is paused. We can restart it. All right. Existing connection. Here we can stop it. And over here we have performance monitor. Now you think, well, why would you have performance monitor here? Because what you can do, and what I'll show you later, is that we can correlate activities within Profiler to events that happen in performance monitor. So if we have some code that's running that spiking CPU, we can correlate it here and pretty easily find out what is causing the CPU to spike. All right, here we can open up Management Studio, and here we get to tile some stuff if you have other windows open. Again, not a lot in terms of our toolbar, but getting familiar with it really will help you get more out of Profiler. All right, in this lecture, let's go ahead and create our first trace. So, Tools, SQL Server Profiler, log on as SA, we'll connect, and let's go in order to, we'll just say standard default, and we'll just hit run. We won't touch anything, we'll just say run. And our trace is started. Now let's come back over here on the instance that we are profiling and let's uh, do a select, right click, new query. Let's go to a table and let's do a select all from, how about, I don't know, let's pick a table, how about this one? And let's see what happened over here. So a whole lot of stuff happened, right? Like you're like, holy cow, what? What went on? Well, remember, it's collecting everything. It's collecting not only what we run, but all the stuff that a SQL Server runs behind the scenes. All right, so while we're here, let's talk a little bit about the screen. First, each row on the screen is an event that has to be captured by a profiler. Second, each column on the screen represents a different data column. Notice again that not all events include all data columns. The trace has many data columns and they are not shown on the screen. The screen itself is divided into two areas. The top portion of the screen lists the events. The bottom portion of the screen, the uh, gray area, shows you the complete contents of the text data column. At the very bottom left of the screen, notice the message trace is running, which gives you the current state of the trace. Other messages that can appear are traces pause and obviously traces stopped. At the bottom right of the screen, you can see the different types of information. First is the line and column number of the row that is currently selected by the cursor. In our case, we're on line 184, column 1, and we have a total of 185 rows. All right, in this lesson, I want to show you how to save a trace file, 
and then open that trace file up from the file system. And I also want to point something out that may not be apparent. So let's come to our new trace. Let's navigate the tools, profiler. So that's bug. All right, let's run the default. And if we come down here over to Manager Studio and we execute this query and we come back to Profiler, it will capture it. However, if you come up and pause it and then come run that same query, all right, it's gone. You can't get that back, right? So if you come back over here and say, uh, let's resume, right? It doesn't capture anything during the pause session. It only captures it when it's running live, all right? So let's go ahead and stop our trace and let's go ahead and save it. So we go to file, we go to save as trace file and I created a folder for the trace course and we'll call this my first trace and we'll save that out and let's close down profiler. Let's go hunt that down. It was on C, it was on trace course and let's take a look at the properties of this file first off the file type it says sql server profiler so let's look at the properties and we can see that traces trace files end in a dot trc all right so all right we can see the profiler has been closed all we have to do to open up any trace is click on it and it will open up profiler and our save trace all right, in this section, in this lecture, let's continue to dive into the trace. So the first goal of this section is to introduce you to the fundamentals of creating a new trace using an example. This will include selecting events, data columns, applying filters, ordering columns, as well as running the trace and saving it to a file or to a database table. We'll go into more detail later in this section. We'll then turn to the topic of templates. Creating your own custom traces is a fundamental skill but it would be a mistake to dismiss the built-in templates that, that Profiler provides you that save you a lot of time in the long run. We'll examine these built-in templates first, then investigate how to modify and create your own custom templates. Finally, you'll build your own templates from scratch. So on our screen here, the first column of the screen is the events. And we're gonna see events a lot, like I mentioned earlier in the course. This is where you select one or more events to be captured in your trace. Here, we can see four event categories, the ones in bold, and six events. All the remaining columns are the available data columns associated with each event. A checkbox in a column means the data column will be captured for that event. The existence of an empty box means that the data column in question is available for that given event, but it's currently not set to collect data. Profiler is showing you the default selection of events and database columns, those that comprise the default template. In fact, this is just a small subset of the events and data columns that are available to you. In order to see all of them, simply check the show all events and show all columns checkboxes in the lower right hand portion of the screen. All right, so the screen is now showing event categories and not specific events. This is why there are no longer any options to select or deselect the data columns. To see specific events, you have to click on the plus sign next to each event category, at which point the checkboxes for the data columns will reappear. Directly below the rows and columns that represent the event and column data to be collected, there are two help boxes. The help box on the top tells you about the category and the help box on the bottom tells you about the different data selected. On the lower right hand corner of our screen, we see column filters. This button allows you to filter out any events together with their data columns that you don't want to capture. The other button, the organized columns button, is the option to perform two tasks. First, you can use it to arrange the order of the data columns on the screen when your trace is running. Secondly, it allows you to group events by a single event type. We'll talk more about these later. All right, in this lesson, let's select some events to trace and then add a filter. 
So let's navigate to our starting point, Tools, SQL Server Profiler. Let's type in this password for the one millionth time. Next, let's come over to Event Selection and let's come down to Show All Events because we want to see all the events we have to choose from. And we want to navigate down to T-SQL because we're going to run some T-SQL. So here we have our event class and here we have the events associated with what we want to capture. Let's capture the statement SQL completed and the recompiles. And we can see every time that we select our event, all the data is chosen for us, all right, all the data points. So if you don't want a data point, say we don't want login name, we simply deselect it. All right, so let's come down and add a filter. Let's come down and choose a filter. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see all the available data columns for all the events we've previously selected. On the right-hand side, we can see where we can add the criteria to filter which events are selected and which are not. So if we select duration, it gives us information about the duration of the event we have selected. So on our left-hand side, we want to filter out database name, but it doesn't show up. So let's cancel out of it. Let's show all columns. Let's return to column filters. And let's choose database name, like. So we want to only capture things that are, isn't our database adventure 20 works 14? Yes. So we only want to capture where the database name is like ADV Adventure Works 2014. So that way, if we have tons of other databases on our instance, we're not going to collect a whole bunch of unnecessary data. So if we say OK, we say Run, we can come over to our window and we can select OK. So let's come over here and see. Let's select something from here. And because there's nothing in it, but we should not see anything from the distribution database. All right, so let's see if we do. Nope, we're still in the AdventureWorks database, all right? Because we're only capturing things that are in the AdventureWorks database, all right? You will use that filter often. All right, in this lecture, I want to show you how to use the grouping function to group our events. All right, we're going to group duration. So let's go and start here at our usual spot, and we'll log on SSA. And of course, we will type this in. <laughs> and here is our default screen we see every time. Let's go over here to event selection. And for this exercise, we can use this default so we don't have to touch anything other than organize columns. And what we'll do at the top here is we see groups. So we can group by any of this. Oftentimes, we'll group by duration to see which store procedures or which transact code or which T-SQL is taking the longest amount of time. And to do that, we just click on duration because that's what we're going to group by, and we hit up. And we move right up to the top underneath the groups. Say OK. And we run. So for this exercise, we simply can't generate enough information to look at it and go, oh, I see the effectiveness of grouping. So what I've done was take this trace and I've profiled a live box with lots of databases and lots of transactions. Let's take a look at that screen print right now. So on the left-hand side, we see duration. Why? Because that's what we've grouped by, all right? So the first figure in duration column is the elapsed time in milliseconds, and it's followed in brackets by the number of events that ran in that duration. The first row shows one event. So if we look down to 923, we see one event, an audit logout. Uh, 1349, one event. We see the completion of a store procedure that I have grayed out, again, because this is a live box. This is a customer box. The same thing for 2293. And at this point, I think you get the idea. Now, to view the actual events, you must click on the plus sign next to the row you want to examine. 
All right, in this lecture, let's learn how to save our trace file to a table. So let's go here and type profiler. Let's find another way to get the profiler Well, it's a little quicker. And just like that, if we type profiler in the search bar, it brings up profiler. We come over here and we say, let's begin our trace. Unfortunately, we have to still type this in. Oh, no, look, it saved it. How odd. All right, we're connecting SQL 1. We're going to start a trace. It, because we're going to output this to a table, we don't care. We're just going to leave this default trace. We're going to say run. And now we're ready to go. If we hit the stop trace button, it stops. An easy way to tell if a trace is running is that the stop button is highlighted in red. It's lit up, so to speak. All right, enough of that. Let's come over here and run some queries. They've run. Let's come over here and stop profiler little button all right so we stopped it now let's come to file save as and here it says trace table all right let's connect to the instance that we're on and we can save it to wherever we'd like let's go and save it to adventureworks and we'll call this will be original and call it trace and we'll say okay and if it's a large trace file it takes some time to export it down here you'll see the export progress Let's go to the table, see if we can find trace. And there it is. Let's see what's in it. Hopefully, what we just executed over here. And sure enough, it is. And you can see how easy it is to export the results to a table. All right, in this lesson, let's go ahead and discuss the templates that come installed with Profiler. First, we have the standard. Profiler comes with eight predefined templates for the database engine, plus a blank one. The standard captures six different events in four different categories security audit, session, store procedure, and T SQL. All right, let's talk a little bit about what it does. Firstly, it lists all the currently existing connections to the server instance you are monitoring. Secondly, it lists the audit events showing you when SQL Server login IDs have logged into and out of the server. Thirdly, it captures the stored procedure execution. And lastly, it captures the T-SQL statements that are not part of stored procedures. It's a good place to start. And then we have SP underscore counts. This is kind of a watered down one. It's very different than the standard, including far fewer events and data columns. This simple template is designed to capture information whenever a store procedure is first started. The results are then sorted by event class, server name, database ID, and object ID. This way, once the output has been collected, it can be sent to a SQL Server database where you can perform transact counts on the object name in order to count how many times each store procedure ran during the trace period. And then there is the T-SQL one. This template is used to capture all T-SQL statements that are submitted to SQL Server by clients along with the timestamps. This one might be used by developers to debug client applications. And then there's T-SQL duration. This template is used to capture all T-SQL statements submitted to SQL Server by clients and their execution time. It groups the results by execution time duration. This one is often used to identify slow queries. And then there's T-SQL grouped. This is used to capture all T-SQL statements submitted to SQL Server and the time they were submitted for execution. Additionally, the statements are grouped by the user or client that submitted the statement. Now, this one's often used to investigate problem queries from a specific client. Then there's T-SQL replay. This is used to capture the appropriate events and data columns about T-SQL statements so the trace can be captured and later replayed back to the server. This is often used for iterative tuning, benchmark testing, and stress testing. T-SQL SPs. This template captures detailed information about all executing stored procedures. It's often used to analyze statements with stored procs. The last one is tuning. This template captures information about stored procedures and T-SQL batch executions. 
This trace can be used with raw data to feed the Database Engine Tuning Advisor for index optimization. And that's all for the ones that come canned with Profiler. All right, in this lecture, let's go and learn how to create our own template. And again, it's pretty straightforward. So let's come up here to Tools, Profiler. And let's come down to SA, Connect. And let's cancel this. All right, let's go to File, Templates, New Template. Pretty straightforward. Let's give the template a name, and we'll call this Mike, how original. And we'll say Save. And it says, wait a minute, you've got to select an event. All right, you just created a blank one. Go select something. All right, so we'll come over here and look at our events. And we'll say we want to the batch started, batch completed, and execute prepared SQL, prepare SQL, and we'll look for recompiles. And we'll say save. We don't even have to run it. Now we can come and use that trace by new trace and back to our familiar boxes here. We'll say connect and we'll come here to use template. And now we have the mic template ready to go. And it is a template we just created with all the data points we just created. All right. So that's pretty straightforward. Now let's come here and say file template, edit the template. And now we can choose what template to edit. I'm going to edit the one I just created. So let's go find Mike and let's go to event selection. And now I don't want recompiles. So save. And now when we run it again, cancel out of you. New trace, connect. If we come over to event selection, when we choose our new trace, where's Mike? There I am. Event selection. We should see that recompiles is gone. And it is. All right. Pretty straightforward on how to create your own templates and to edit them. Now let's delete it. Let's go to File, Templates, Edit the Template, and let's find our template. Uh, there's Mike. And there it is. Delete Mike. Save. And now when we come back to our templates, Mike will not be there. I mean, hopefully. Template and Mike is gone. All right, so that's it with creating templates, editing the existing template or any other template for that matter, and then deleting the template. So in the last section, we learned how to select our events select our data columns for the events, and create templates. This is all a very straightforward process. However, the problem is not the mechanics of selecting the events, but deciding which of the 170 profiler events and 64 data columns we really want to use. So the answer is there's no easy way to decide which events or data columns you need to capture as part of the trace. It depends upon the problem and it requires a good understanding of the events. Almost all beginners add more events than they need, and then they add more data columns. Many will just select all of the data columns. The one thing about traces is that the more you analyze, the more you capture, the more difficult they are to read. It's easy to get overwhelmed, and then you become discouraged because you want to learn to master profiler, you have all this data, None of it really makes sense. Not only that, but the more data you collect, the greater the hit on the box. Now, there is the other end of the spectrum, right? If you don't collect enough data, then you are right where you were with collecting too much data, right? There's a sweet spot. And oftentimes, the only way to learn the sweet spot is to simply create traces and capture events to look at. In this lesson, let's learn another interesting point about our filters. Uh, they don't reduce the workload. Many DBAs assume they do, and I wish they did, but that's not the case. Here's why. When you select an event for SQL Server to trace, SQL Trace, the SQL Server component that actually does the tracing work, 
has to look at every event that is occurring in order to identify a particular event as the one you want to collect. If you don't have a column filter, then your trace will record data for every occurrence of that event in your instance of SQL Server. This alone is a lot of work. When you add a column filter, every event is still captured. But then SQL Server also has to decide whether to keep that event stored in RAM or on disk or toss it away. There is some good news here. While the addition of column filters does introduce additional CPU overhead, it does reduce the number of events that are stored in RAM and written out to disk. This acts to reduce the amount of resources used to run profiling. The hard part is gauging whether or not the extra resources needed to apply the filter are more or less than the resources saved by limiting the number of the events collected. In this lesson, let's talk about categories. And they're really just a guide here. Individual events are divided into categories of similar events. The purpose of this is to allow you to more easily locate the events you're looking for. However, it's not designed as a shortcut to help you identify with which events to select. All right, let's take a look at the performance event category in front of us. Now, you might be thinking you could use this to diagnose a problem with slow performing queries. You might be tempted to assume it's as simple as selecting the events performance event category. Nope, not the case. You'll need to carefully select trace events from multiple event categories. Rarely, if ever, will you be selecting all the events and all the data points from one category. As we discussed earlier, all the data columns for a given event are automatically selected. All right. In most cases, we're going to want to select an event and then deselect some of that data. A common mistake is to leave all those columns there and have all that data collected unnecessarily. It's additional clutter we don't need and it's resource intensive. All right, in this lesson, I want to show you some tricks inside a trace. All right, so we've got a trace open here. Let's go to the properties of it, properties. And let's go to the event selection. And now let's come down to performance. We had this selected from a previous video, so we'll keep it selected. Now, let's say we wanted to select all of the auto stats. So instead of doing this, which really is a pain, you can highlight it, right click, and then select event. And it will highlight and select all the data points for that event. You can deselect it. Additionally, you can right click on this and organize our columns. Now we can't drag and drop, but we can click on something. Let's say that we want the database name. So we want to see what database we're in. We can move it up, put it right beside text data. I want the data of the code, then I want the database name, and then let's say I want reads. Let's move reads up. Let's say OK, and let's say run. And now we've got our text data, the code, our database name, and reads. All right, simple, but there are two things that are going to really help you out when you start crafting your own traces. All right, previously we saw where we could add filters to our traces, but we can also add multiple filters. So let's come up to our trace here that's opened, file, properties, event selection, column filters, and here we're filtered on reads, application name, not like, SQL Server Profiler. Let's filter on CPU greater than or equal to 50. And as we click on something to filter with, you can see that we have this little blue funnel besides what we're filtering on, right? That allows us to filter on multiple ones. To remove it, we click on it and we take that, we hit back and we remove the filter, right? Uh, hit back, hit the backspace, delete, yes. Tab out of it. I didn't want into username. Like what? Not like what? All right, there we go. Nice and clean. So we can easily choose multiple filters by selecting what we want to filter and adding it. And we'll see the little blue funnel. 
All right, in this lecture, I want to show you how to do a wildcard search with a filter. So let's go to new. Let's connect to the instance. Let's come over to event selection. Let's come over to column filters. Let's choose a database name. And we'll say not like. What database do we not want? Wildcard, ADV, wildcard. So when we say OK, anything that's caught being traced should not come from AdventureWorks because AdventureWorks starts with ADV. Over here, I've got this. Here's the output from a trace earlier. Let's say execute. And it didn't capture it. Let's come over here and let's go to a system database. Let's see, can I find a table in a system database? Is there anything in these? And it does capture those. Use distribution, use distribution. See the use statements? All right, but it doesn't want to come over here and I say new query. There are no use statements for AdventureWorks. So wildcards are powerful. They allow us to do wildcard searches and restrictions from within profile. In this lecture, let's talk about an option in our trace properties screen called server processes trace data. So in the general tab of the trace properties screen, you see a save to file option. When you choose save to file, two additional buttons become available. One is called server processes trace data. With this option selected, Profiler ensures that all events are recorded, even if this means that SQL Service instance performance were hurt. To accomplish this task, two separate trace processes are started to trace exactly the same events as each other. One trace process sends events to the GUI, the Profiler GUI, and the other trace process sends the data to a local file on disk. While this ensures that all the events are captured, it also means that a significant burden may be put on SQL Server, hurting its performance. If your SQL Server box isn't that busy, then performance probably won't be an issue. If the instance is very busy, then the performance hit could affect production. So if the option is not selected, Profiler doesn't guarantee that all events will be captured and only one process is used to capture events. This reduces the performance burden on SQL Server significantly. If your SQL box isn't that busy, there shouldn't be any loss of events. But if the server is busy and Profiler thinks that capturing all events would hurt performance of the instance, then events will be dropped as needed to prevent significant performance hit. So how do you use this? Well, if your server is too busy, then all the events will be captured anyway. If your server is very busy, you most likely don't want to add any additional performance burden to it. In the majority of cases, missing some events won't affect your analysis, so it's not a problem. In rare circumstances when your server is really busy, but you can't seem to find events to resolve the problem, then you probably want to select this. At the same time, ensure you're only collecting those events and data columns you really need. All right, in this lesson, let's learn two additional tips or tricks that we can use to help us with our traces. So the first one is to put a end date on our traces. Now this seems like such a simple thing, uh, but I promise it's not. So let's go file, let's go to properties. And down here it says enable trace stop time. Please go ahead and start putting stop times on your traces. Don't run this and get up and walk away. I work in an environment now where I'm new to the organization and the development staff was allowed to trace on production boxes. And not only that, they had a habit of two or three people setting up traces and not using this button. They would deselect that, they would hit run and then walk away. And on production boxes, because there were lots of developers, they would have four or five traces running at one time. Not to mention they were using 
SQL Sentry, which creates a trace, and that's how it captures the data. So I had to write a kill script for all those and eventually take away the ability for the developers to do traces on production boxes. So even if you're a DBA, click this, end it, set a time. All right, tip number two. When we start our trace here, and right now we're not capturing anything, but when you have millions of transactions happening in a minute, you're going to see it continue to scroll. So even if you catch something and you want to stop it, you won't be able to. All right, let's turn off that annoying function so you'll be able to stop and see whatever you want. So let's come up here to a window, and there it is. All right, turn on the auto scroll, and now instead of scrolling down when all those transactions are flowing through Profiler, you can stop and say, oh, I want to see that one. All right. Simple. I promise you're going to use the auto scroll a lot. And hopefully you'll use the end time for your traces a lot also. One of the things DBAs face on a daily basis is the problem of a poorly performing SQL Server. So what do we look for? We're looking for a few things. We're looking for queries that take one minute, five minutes, or longer. We're looking for queries that cause CPU utilization spikes. We're looking for queries that block one another. While blocking is a component of OLTP databases, excessive blocking isn't. We never want to see one SPID blocking another for a very long time. So one of the great tools that we have for identifying these slow running queries is Profiler. And in this section, what we're going to do is create a trace to capture all the information we need to identify and analyze these slow running queries. Now, it's important to remember that the analysis of the queries is really beyond the scope of this course. I have a whole series of courses that are actually dedicated to performance tuning. This course is simply on identifying those queries. So let's get started. In this lesson, let's talk about the process of event selection. So before we can start capturing our events, we need to decide what we want to capture. Well, we've already said we want to capture information pertaining to slow running queries. OK, but you know, what's a query? A query comes to SQL Server in many forms. For example, they come to SQL Server in the form of store procedures, batches of queries, individual queries. So essentially, it's necessary to capture all three forms of slow running queries so we can see them all. Also keep in mind that stored procs can be executed in two different ways, an RPC event and a transactile event. Oh, wait a minute, what's, what's RPC? All right, well, yes, this is a deep dive, but let's see if we can't give you a high level definition of RPC. RPC stands for Remote Procedure Call. Think of RPC as something as a level above TCP IP that's used as a low level and insecure networkable communications framework by Windows. So you're thinking, well, wait a minute, why not just use TCP IP, right? Well, okay, at the time Windows NT was engineered, 1993, that's going back a little ways, you had other network protocols besides TCP IP that were being used often. You had NetBIOS, you had NetWare, Apple Talk. So I think Microsoft said, listen, we need a network agnostic way for Windows components to be able to talk to one another. So there is an RPC call. That's what that is. We also need to include any additional events that will provide us the clues to why a particular query is slow, such as events that provide information about how the query performs and context events that help put the query in perspective. While there's no single correct combination of events, hopefully I can give you a template that you can use that will get you most of the way there. All right, in this lecture, let's go ahead and select the events for our trace. Now, I like four because I like the watered down version of what I'm capturing. I don't like to see a lot of things. So what do I like to see? I like to see RPC completed. I like to see SP, statement completed, batch starting, SQL, 
batch completed. All right, so what is RPC completed? The RPC completed event fires after a stored procedure is executed as a remote procedure call. This is a useful event. We want to capture information about the execution of stored procedures, including the duration, CPU, reads, writes, together with the name of the stored proc that ran. If a stored procedure is called by transact SQL execute statement, then this event will not fire. Additionally, the event does not fire for transact SQL statements that occur outside a stored procedure, which is why we need PSQL. The SP statement completed event tells us when a statement within a stored proc has completed. It also provides us the text, the transact code, of the statement along with the event's duration, CPU, reads, and writes. Keep in mind that a single stored procedure may contain a single or many individual statements. For example, if a stored procedure executes five select statements, then there will be five SP statement completed events for that stored proc. The event does not fire for a transact SQL statement that occurs outside a stored proc. All right, so we've got SQL batch starting. Batch starting event is fired whenever a new transact SQL batch begins. This can include a batch inside or outside the stored proc. This is useful because it fires any time a new stored procedure or transact SQL statement fires. Then we have SQL batch completed. The SQL batch completed event occurs when a transact SQL statement completes, whether the transact SQL statement is inside or outside the stored procedure. If the event is a stored proc, SQL batch completed provides the name of the stored procedure, but not the actual transact SQL code, together with duration, CPU reads and writes of the statement. All right, I do realize that I packed a lot of information there about each event. Let's just review what the four events are. So we've got RPC completed. A completed event fires after a stored procedure is executed as a remote procedure call. All right, how about SP statement completed? This event tells us when a statement within a stored procedure has completed. All right, how about batch starting? Batch starting event fires when a new transact batch begins. This can include a batch inside or outside a stored proc. All right, well, how about batch completed? The batch completed event occurs when a transact SQL statement completes, whether the transact SQL statement is inside or outside the stored procedure. All right, in this lesson, let's talk about the global trace option setting within Profiler. Now, if you want to, you can change the font name and the size you wish to display events in Profiler. Again, I don't think I've ever seen that change, but it's there if you want it. By default, date and time values displayed by Profiler use the fixed format used by SQL Server. If you want another format, you can select Use Regional Settings to display date and time values. In 2005, Duration was measured by Profiler in microseconds, but is displayed in Profiler in milliseconds by default. If you would prefer to see a microseconds displayed instead of milliseconds inside Profiler, then select Show Values in Duration Column and Microseconds checkbox. The next one you can see is Start Tracing Immediately After Making Connection. Don't know why it's there, you can ignore it. File Rollover Options. This option applies when you have a pre-existing trace file for display by profiler. By default, the option load all rollover files in sequence without prompting is selected. This means if you attempt to load a trace file that includes rollover files, that all the rollover files are loaded automatically in sequence. If you choose the option prompt before loading rollover files, then you will be prompted to load each rollover file. You can choose to load or not. Replay options. The default number of replay threads option determines how many threads are used to play back events. The default is four and normally shouldn't be changed. Increasing the value will obviously use more server resources. The default health monitor wait interval option affects the amount of time that a thread is allowed to run before it's turned off by the health monitor. The default is 3,600 seconds or one hour. The default health monitor pull interval specifies how often the health monitor pulls replays so it can determine how long they have been running. 
the default is 60 seconds, and I'd leave that alone. As a general aside, I don't touch anything on the screen in most of my environments. All right, in this lecture, let's take a look at the output of our trace with the columns we selected. So the first thing that catches your eye about the trace is the duration on the left-hand side. The duration is 16 milliseconds, and the event class is RPC completed. Now, only RPC completed events will have a duration, which makes sense because completed means they finished, and it would be able to calculate that duration. The other thing you may notice is that the CPU and reads are populated, signaling this storage procedure had CPU cost and reads. Now let's take a look at the object name of the RPC starting event, which signals the start of the execution of the stored proc. Don't forget this is a live box with about 250 million transactions a day on it. Can you find the corresponding SQL completed event? Hint, the object name and the text data columns are identical. All right, now it's your turn. Find the RPC starting event for the SP customer select stored proc. Okay. Now find the completion event. Okay, now what reads are associated with that RPC completed event for that stored proc? Once we begin to analyze the output and we get the basics, it becomes very easy to read these traces. All right, having discussed the profiler events we needed to identify slow queries and why, let's look at some data columns. Again, it's important to select only the data columns you need, and in the screen print, you'll probably be able to find some right away you don't need. Just as a hint, check out that binary data column. I'm not sure what that gives us. All right, let's take a look at a few columns that give us the information we want. Duration. This is a very useful data column because it provides the length of time in microseconds that an event takes from beginning to end. What's curious about the duration is it's displayed in the profiler GUI. It's shown in milliseconds. So internally, SQL Server does the conversion. Since our goal of the trace is to identify long-running queries, the duration data column is central to our analysis. Let's look at object name. This is a logical name of the object being referenced during the event. If a stored procedure is being executed, then the name of the stored procedure is displayed. If it's an isolated query, then the message dynamic SQL is inserted in that data column. There's text data. This one's pretty self-explanatory. It is the data of the event that's being captured. For SQL batch starting and SQL batch completed, uh, for these events, text data column will either contain the name of the executing store procedure or for a query outside the store procedure, the transact code of the query. CPU, again, an obvious one. This data shows the amount of CPU time used for an event. This is in milliseconds. Obviously, the smaller number, the fewer CPU resources it uses. Smaller is better. Reads. This data column shows the number of logical page reads that occurred during the event. Again, the smaller, the better. The fewer disk IO resources we can use during the event, the better. Writes. This data column shows the number of physical writes that occurred during the event and provides an indication of the IO resources that were used for an event. Database name. Yep, you got it. Obvious one. It captures the name of the database that the stored proc or SQL statement or the transact is being executed against. Start time. Virtually every event has a start time data column, and as you would expect, it includes the time the event started. Often, the start time of the event can be matched or related to events during the order of execution. It can also be compared to the stop time events to determine the time difference between the execution of the event, when it started and when it completed. So as you can see on the screen, we have a really good template for capturing slow running store procedures. As a matter of fact, if you've added your events and you follow along, you might want to save this as a template. All right, now let's continue with analysis of our trace. 
So in this video, we're going to group by duration so we can drill down a little further into our data. So again, what jumps out here in the trace are the ones at the bottom of our page. Why? Because those are the ones with the longest duration. The rows highlighted in blue aren't events, but aggregated results of the events. The rows in white are the actual events captured by Profiler, and this is where you should focus your attention. The higher the number, the slower the query. That means we're always going to know where to start tuning with this template. Note that since the events are grouped by duration, each event is aggregated by duration. All right, next we notice the application name column and the slowest queries in the box are all part of the same application. That's pretty common actually. Now in the object name column, we see that many of the slow runners are from the same store procedure. That one that starts with SP insert. Next, check out our database column. There are different database names, but the same bad stored proc. What's that tell us? That means that the company is using the same database template for all the customers. A smart decision from a code reuse point of view and a horrible one from a performance point of view because they're taking that code and for each client they roll out, they're putting bad code on our box. All right, let's summarize what we've learned so far. We've identified several long running queries. We've discovered that a single store procedure was the cause of most of our slowest queries. We then drilled down further into the data and found out our poorly performing code was coming from the same application. We also found out the same code was running on different databases signaling the poorly performing code was deployed across the organization. Now, we're armed with some concrete information we can take back to development and the business to further discuss what we can do with this store procedure.